feel good fathers. Why is no one talking about growth and purpose together? The intersection, not that people don't talk about growth mindset, not that people don't talk about purpose and not that you haven't heard these terms before, but what do they mean together? It's this question that we're really going to explore today on the podcast. I'm joined by my guest, Matt Findora. We had a great conversation off air before we got going. He is a mindset coach and he is also the host of the Choose to Live, Love, and Grow podcast. I'm really excited to jump into this topic today. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. We were just talking about growth. We were just talking about what this means. We're going to get into growth and purpose. Let's start with growth and what does it mean? So a growth mindset is one where you start seeking out opportunities you start seeking out feedback, you start believing that life is happening for me instead of life is happening to me. Because when we're in that fixed state, the opposite of growth mindset, you're just, you feel stuck. You may feel like, hey, it is what it is. And so when you, those two different versions, when you think of the fixed mindset and, oh, life, oh that's just the way it is, you kind of stop growing, you stop moving forward and you're like, well, it is, you know, it is what it is, right? That's a phrase people throw out there so often. And so the, I love, I I love this. um, I I, I love this like concept, but I really want to make it concrete. And I want to put together an example here because I I just want to make sure it's crystal clear because I know you and I are both in agreement here. Uh, When you wake up first thing in the morning, what is the texture of your thought in there? And so for instance, and I'm asking, so Matt, I'm asking you as the mindset coach, if I wake up first thing in the morning, I'm like, oh, I'm awake. Now I would never say this, but it's, it's, it's what my brain says to me. It's my inner monologue, right? Mm. What is that? What is I'm awake? So that initial, so your initial thoughts essentially set up the, your day right? So that, that the, uh, I'm awake. You're already regretting being awake. You're already putting yourself in this position of, you know what, I, whatever happens, happens. Uh, I don't, I don't really want to move forward in this. And so when you start your day off like that, it's so much harder when it's, you know, breakfast time, when it's noon to counteract and be like, you know what, I, I could turn things around. So those initial thoughts that we have literally set up our entire day. Awesome. And so is this an example of like a fixed, is that an example of a fixed mindset or like that victim mindset or that life is happening to me mindset? Yes. So that would be, so depending on where that comes from, it could be a fixed state of I'm just going through the motions or it could Mm -hmm. be that victim mindset of, oh, I can't believe I have to do this again. Like, you know what? I, I have to get up. I have to go to a work. I have to go to a job that I hate. Oh, the kids are going to wake up soon. Like, I don't, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not fully awake yet. I just have to deal with that. So you start, it's almost like this inner critic. The, the easiest way of saying the victim mindset, because people get this, um, this term that, oh, it's, it's for the people that are like really, really like depressed or victim mindset. Right. But we all kind of suffer from it because essentially it's just our inner critic that's grown. Mm, I love that. So it's the inner critic that's grown. Uh, so, so great. So now let's go through that same example, right? I've got like, so our man in this example, our father in this example has, he's got kids, he's got to go to work. He's getting up early. He's got all these things. He said, Ugh. so what could he do that would be the opposite of that? What could he do that would be that growth mindset there? So the easiest thing, and I've, I've heard this so often, and when people practice it, you could see it in them, is wake up, say something you're grateful for. Because that initial, that, that initial like, oh, I'm grateful for, you know, it's a weekend. Oh, I'm grateful I get to hear my kids' laughter first thing in the morning. Something to, to that, is, to that uh, effect. Or, oh, I'm so glad I get to work on my business today. When you, when you start your day off like that, you're now looking like, oh, things are life, good things are attracted to me. And so you now get to go, okay. And that kind of just starts to grow and multiply in those thoughts that more good things are going to come my way because I started off my day of 
this is going to be great. This is going to be a great day. The sun is shining. I, I love it. This feels so much like that growth in this context is a byproduct. It's the result of what you're doing, not what you're doing. Like what you're doing is being grateful or going through the motions or um, doing it. You're doing the same thing as somebody with a fixed mindset or a victim mindset. But the difference is, is that um, you're sort of replacing it with gratitude in this example. And then you're going through the motions. I can see you emphatically nodding. So for those mm -hmm. listening, he's in fat, Matt is emphatically nodding. So I, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, absolutely. I think that a fixed state, a fixed mindset doesn't necessarily mean you can't grow from it. That just means, hey, the, the difference between growing from a victim mindset and a fixed mindset is self-awareness. Once you actually start paying attention to that, how your mindset is, uh, then you educate yourself on the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. You can start implementing strategies, no matter how small they are, to actually, hey, I'm going to start you know, that growth mindset. Something as simple as find one thing that you're grateful every single day, and it's just going to keep building. And then that's when you start to lose that fixed mindset when it comes to certain situations, those difficult challenges that come up. You can actually start looking at it differently like, oh, I, you know what? I can do this. Like, and even if it's really, really hard, you know what? It's, it's not that big. It's not, it's one of my favorite phrases now is it's not that deep. Awesome. Okay, great. So what are some other examples of either situations or strategies that we can put in place that uh, that a feel good father would commonly come in across. When you're dealing with your young kids and they're just fighting, and you're like, and you just become so impatient, and you're like, come on, like this is this is not rocket science. It's okay to just get along, right? You get into you get into that fixed state of oh, these kids are never going to change. They're just always going to fight. They're always going to you know pull toys from each other, and it's instead by having that growth mindset is it's kind of not necessarily puts the blame on you, but it holds the accountability on yourself of, Hey, you know what? Maybe they just don't understand. They haven't been role modeled the proper way of handling this situation. So let's tell them, Hey, it's okay. You can still grow from this. Let's work together and model this behavior and work through that. Because one of the things that I mentioned that's important about growth mindset is feedback. And so if you're giving them feedback, now they can, they're going to remember, oh, okay, like I can work through this too. Yeah. This is really reminding me of that. Um, with some of our, with some people, they're grown up with like, either they can or they can't do something. And they're, I, I'm thinking lots like Carol, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck's mindset book, which is growth versus fixed mindset. And it's like, you know, as, as weird as his, like, don't tell somebody that they're smart or don't tell somebody that they're beautiful or don't tell them something like this. These are like kind of fixed states. And, um, this is like an, ex I, I, this, I think this is a little bit extreme, but in this world, if you tell a kid for a long time that they're intelligent or that they're smart or that they can, or something like that, the moment that they hit any roadblock, they're like, oh, I must not be smart anymore. Mm. And so you're kind of setting them up for that Ooh, in the morning a situation where like they, they hit that one, that one issue and they're like, Oh, I can't move forward. I'm not smart anymore. Whereas, um, and we've been doing this with my, my oldest lately has been, I've been rewarding her more for the work. It's mm -hmm. like, Oh, like she's, she's developing her artistic drawing right now. And I just say, wow, I, wow, look how great it looks. I can see that you've been putting in so much work and effort into this. Like I can see that you've been drawing, you know, she draws every day. It's like, I can see that you've doing, been doing this work and look at these results that you've been developing. Um, so that, that it, it's kind of reminded me of that. So now we're in like, so I think we have a decent understanding here and concept of like what growth is. And so now it's like, okay, what, what's purpose? Let's define purpose here. So purpose is, so one of the common myths I, I, I want to start off with that is we have to find our purpose. And so mm -hmm. it's not about finding your purpose, it's about creating your purpose. And because your purpose comes through your experiences, 
And how else are you going to have those experiences without trying multiple things to figure out what is the things that I want to do? Because we sit here, especially when the kids, when kids are young, we tell them, hey, try the food, see if you like it, see if you don't, and then we can go from there, right? Instead of, oh, you're not going to like this, or oh, I think you're, you're going to like this. You're giving them the opportunity to figure out, do I like this or do I not like this? And then that's how they create their palate. It's the same thing when it comes to their purpose. Hey, I'm going to go try, I'm going to go do some volunteer work at a soup kitchen. Hey, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to learn about the, the, the body, or I'm going to go learn about the mind. It's like, okay, well, what, what do I like doing? I'm going to go try out baseball or another sport. You're, you're finding these opportunities and being like, once you establish, Hey, these, this is what I like. This is what I enjoy. How do I give back to the world of while I'm doing my passion, how can I give back to the world, give back to society and have that type of impact? And I think it's really important here to add some extra, extra layers to this is that I, I think it's totally fine if you're a feel good father and your contribution is supporting your family. I think Absolutely. that's totally great. That's a, that's a very virtuous, very purpose driven life. You know, you can grow in this capacity. You can uh, decide that, okay, well, um, maybe for the next, especially for our young feel good fathers, right? For our, with young kids, it's totally okay to be like, you know what? For the next three to four years, my kid was just born. And, and up until they're about four or five, like if you think about everything, you're changing diapers, you're not getting a lot of sleep, you're, you're teething, uh, first words, uh, potty training, uh, early, early chores. It's like all these extra things that are just, they're not sapping your time. It's a prioritization of your effort and your energy. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes like, I think it's very common and I would absolutely encourage and endorse many, many feel good fathers to lean into their family for the first part, like at least for the first part, if not developing that as a habit, <laughs> like doing that for forever, <laughs> but, uh, leaning into your family and, and kind of, uh, developing that, that purpose there and helping your kids, as you're saying, have experiences and you experiencing things with your family. So, um, I think this is super great. This is a really interesting thing. Uh, what else would you add here as far as, uh, purpose to this discussion? It's going to change. It's not going to be the same thing for the next 10 years. It's going to be a season of your life, you know, whether that's six months, three years, 10, five years, whatever the case may be, it's going to change and it's going to, it might pivot, it might get more defined, it might get more broad, but if you're always focusing on what is that purpose, what is my why, why am I doing these things, you're always going to be in tune with your purpose and you'll figure out in life, does this thing that I'm about to do correlate with my purpose? Does this, do these meet each other? And then you can actually focus on your purpose for almost, you know, the rest of your life. I love it. I absolutely love that. Uh, this really opens up into the, I think the next part of our discussion, which is goals and habits. And you were telling me, it was so funny. You were like, I have this new, this new idea. I have this idea about setting goals. And I was like, don't tell me, don't tell me. This is all off air. I'm like, don't tell me, Matt, tell me on the air. So, um, how, how do you set goals? And, and in addition to that, you know, I really want to help. I want to understand and I want feel good fathers to understand like together, how are we integrating the goals that we're setting with this growth mindset and purpose? Mm. So I like looking at it as purpose is essentially our blueprints, right? The purpose is our blueprints of life. And so the goals that we have are the building or the design, I forget how I usually word this. It's, it's, you've got the blueprints, you've got the, the concept of, Hey, this is how I want to build it. You got the blueprints of goals where, okay, if I put these things together this way, I'm going to be able to get to my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so for goals, the acronym we hear a lot is SMART, right? So we got specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and a timetable. But I think there's a way to make it smarter. So the way we make smarter goals is we add the E and the R. So E is easy to start. 
You have to come up with some quick thing to actually get you invested into this goal because sometimes we make our goals too large and it makes it feel impossible to actually create. So if we start off making it easy to start the goal, we're more inclined to continuously work at that goal. And then you add the R, the R is reflection. You have to reflect on it at for a period of time. You have to figure out what works best for you. When we set a New Year's resolution, often that R is uh, New Year's Eve is when I'm going to look back at that New Year's resolution and did I do that, right? So if we start off, whether that's weekly, monthly, daily, however, whatever works best for us, we have to find a way to reflect on that goal. I love um, I love this, and especially the reflection part. I, I think there's merits and easy, and we'll kind of go through these different steps. But the reflection piece, you know, this year was one of the first years that I did. And so it's 2024. So I did a full review on 2023, and I was like, what worked, what didn't, and then I kind of set the intention. I was like, well, what do I really want this year to be about? Like, what is it that I'm moving towards? Almost like, what's my purpose? Uh, you know. Um, how do you how do you suggest that we reflect? Is there a, a process or something here that that would help in in setting up a, a solid reflection uh, practice? Whatever that goal is, think about the steps that you actually took to achieve it, and did that get you closer or farther away? Mm. Did how much time did you actually invest in your goal? Because if you didn't invest a lot of time maybe that goal doesn't align with your purpose or maybe you made it too difficult and then you can pivot or change it however you feel necessary so you can actually achieve it. Because once you start achieving your goals throughout that journey, you're getting that dopamine fix of, hey, I'm getting a little closer, I'm getting a little closer, a little closer. And then you could set maybe set another goal or whatever and your journey is going to continue pushing you to your purpose and continue on the path that you initially set up for yourself. Got it. So it sounds like we were really kind of to, to bring it down, like we got the purpose as the blueprint, but I, I think this really does sound like the purpose is the mountain that we're walking towards. And then the goal um, with the reflection is what's the road or the path that we've been taking to get there. And sometimes we're walking, sometimes we're crawling, sometimes we're going backwards, sometimes we're going sideways, sometimes we're flying, sometimes we're in a car, you know, sometimes we're, you know, on a bike, whatever the add, add your random mode of transportation that you want to take, you know, uh, whatever it happens to be. Um, that sounds really great. Your, like, um, your concept of making it easy to start in the beginning is not something that we talk about at all. Mm -hmm. Like the, the reflection piece I think is really interesting because that is, uh, here's the idea, right? I don't think life is easy or hard. I think life is. And, but I do think uh, this is based on that growth and, and uh, mindset we were talking about earlier. I think that life can be uh, simple or challenging, right? Like life can either feel like ease, like an ease, like I don't want to say easy, just like an ease, like a greased machine, or it can feel challenging, like almost like going downhill or going uphill. And I think that, um, so that's, I, I you know, I, I call that the peaks and valley. And I think that one of the hardest things that we do, and this has to do with that psychological concept of loss aversion, right? Is that we've set this goal and what you were actually just suggesting, and I, I think it's a great idea. And I'd love to hear your, your response to this, um, that in the reflection, you might have to scrap the goal and move to a different goal. Uh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Response. Because if you're not putting in the time, right, that's, or you're already showing your, yourself that this goal doesn't align with me, or maybe there's, there's an obstacle there, you didn't make it easy enough to enter. And then when you actually are reflecting on that, you might see, you know what, like, oh, my, my goal, let's, let's use a healthy fitness goal, right? You want to get healthy? Oh, I want to get really lean. I want to weigh this much pounds. And what you might not realize is, your purpose is still your, or your nest, maybe your overall goal was, yeah, I want to be healthy, but working out to that point doesn't, I can, either I can't maintain that or it just doesn't work for me. I don't want to do it. So maybe that might be something as, you know what, I'm going to start walking more, or maybe I'm going to focus on my nutrition and make sure I'm just eating the right foods. And then that could become your goal 
and you set this a nutrition plan versus a workout plan. Mm. I love that. So that's the, we're kind of going into, I, I had learned about this concept from Tim Ferriss and it was about the four hour body. And this was like the Pareto principle. There's usually one or two, and this is really, I'm going to say the word because we're going to get into it, habits. There's usually one or two habits that you have that determine your results, right? Uh, and and I think this is interesting because, uh, oh goodness, is it is it Atomic Habits where he discusses it? I think so. Oh, sorry, I'm looking. Uh, for those of you that are listening, I just looked back at my bookcase to remind myself, but it's you don't climb to the um, the desire of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems or habits, right? And so, uh, you know, what Matt was just saying with that nutrition thing, that's so I just lost um, 3% body fat and I, and I shed about 10 pounds and I did that simply by eliminated added sugar. So mm. any product that had added sugar, I got rid of. Now, I still had maple syrup and I still had honey on some things, but I ate no food with added sugar for a month. And I had that simple result. So it's like the nutrition plan is there. And so that's a really concrete example. Let's talk about professional. What is a professional goal, a professional Pareto principle that uh, either one of your clients or um, that you've gone through to um, help succeed in whatever it is you're trying to accomplish professionally? So um, in your example that you had where you said purpose is the mountain, goals is the, transport, is the mode of transportation, habits is the mechanics, the, the preventative maintenance that you're doing on that transportation. So mm. for a professional, m most people, not everybody, have the dream, the goal of progressing in their job, in their field of study, whatever that may be. So if we create what's called a micro habit, a micro habit is essentially a much smaller version of a regular habit. You can start working your way up slowly. It's almost like James Clear says with his at growing 1% each day, that's essentially, you know, creating this micro habit. And so professionally, that could be something as simple as I'm going to read one chapter per day. I'm not a great reader but I'm going to focus my attention on the subject that I want to learn and read one chapter a day. And what ends up happening is it might be like five pages. You're like, I'm done, you know, no big deal. Or it might be 30 pages, right? Because it's a, it's one of those fixed variables there, but you'll realize and recognize as you continue, as you do it one time, then you do it the next day and the next day, that habit becomes so much easier because you set up that system of, I'm going to keep working on this goal, on this, on this habit. Awesome. And so, um, how do we, how do we identify, um, number one, how do we identify the small step that adds ease to the goal? And then it, it, it almost feels like what you're describing is that part of that small step can be a maintenance step that be, that we make a habit. And so the habit kind of becomes a, or the, the goal becomes a new habit that we have in our life. It, can we draw that connection? Yeah. Um, when you're doing, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Cause I usually go to fitness is usually the most common thing that people can, can sure. understand. Let's do, right? let's do fitness. Let's do so, it. Let's do fitness. When somebody doesn't want to work out or they, they want to work out, we, we stick to those micro habits that easy to start. And that could be something as simple as I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to work out for five minutes. That's it. Which I think James Clear also mentions in his book when he, that initial buildup is this person goes to the gym, they go for five minutes and they do it for a week straight. And what people think is like, why, why are you going to the gym for five minutes, right? You're not doing anything. But what that's building for them is, oh, this is so easy. I could keep doing this. I, I could do 10 minutes. So then they go for 10 minutes. Then the next week it's 15 minutes. And then they keep growing from there. Um, you also have the, the concept for the maintenance side of things, right? Which is what you asked. A micro habit, that micro habit could be something as simple as auditing or journaling. What, it, what, is, what did I eat today? Or, you know, what, what was my workout today? How did this make me feel after I did this? And that feeling, that emotion that you actually attach to that makes that goal worth so much more and means so much more to you. 
Mm, got it. Okay. So let's let's bring this all let's bring this all circle around and let's go through sort of some common examples of how we would discuss or improve in in our house. Like the um what are the here's here's one example. As a as a young father, uh, we don't typically understand the growth and change from uh, basically uh, married or uh, romantically involved with somebody to being a father and the exchange of usually, usually I'll just say extracurricular, <laughs> the, the extra activities that occur in that world. So it, it cut off. So could you just re, re ask the question? Oh yeah, sure. So the idea was what are some other examples that fathers that feel good fathers might go through that uh, we can kind of discuss as, um, cause like, I know I have some things that, that, you know, I'm working through that we can, we can discuss, or what are some things that you're seeing that, that fathers typically go through? It's interesting. Cause I feel like this goes into, to men's mental health a little bit, but it's, um, knowing that you're not alone and that there are other fathers out there who are dealing with the same exact thing that you are and creating that support system and finding time once a week, what, you know, a day, once every so often of actually connecting with another father and sharing those, those challenges with somebody else, that's going to help you be a better father because you're going to realize, okay, it's first off, it's not that deep or, Hey, here's a solution because I have no idea how I'm going to handle this situation. Um, one of my favorite examples here was um, uh, my oldest is getting to the age of exerting a little bit more identity and ind independence. And I remember when, uh, and so there was a little bit of, I'm kind of like seeing how to, how to figure it out. Just, I think common for, for our young ladies, it's a little bit of like, sarcastic over exuberance exuberance so kind of like i don't want to say mean girlness but just a little bit of like playing with personality and stuff like that and i remember i was in because i'm in a, a men's men's mastermind so i have a group of other fathers and i was describing like oh this is so frustrating to me i don't know what to do you know i feel like every conversation we have i'm getting this negative response and like i kid you not every <laughs> every other father in the room was like yep that's normal. Just that's normal. They're going to do that. Mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh, and they, and the only thing they said was just keep loving on them. Just keep loving. Just keep, keep putting the love, keep showing that you're there, that you're going to help them through it. You don't have to correct anything. They're just doing it. They're just figuring out who they are. And, uh, you happen to be somebody that they know, love and feel safe with. And so, uh, you can feel normal in that capacity. So I love, I love here that your example of finding that men's group, finding um, either other solutions or just discussion points, because uh, you need support, you need help. Mm -hmm. What are some other examples? Um, other examples. It's a tough one. Right. Using that. And, and I haven't really thought of it in that aspect. I just usually think of, um, you know, connecting better as a father. Well, how do you, how do you connect better? I mean, the, the things that are true for mental health are true for everyone. So how do you connect better as one father to another? So one other thing. So I mentioned the, the idea of sharing your struggles and challenges with other men. I think you should, you also need to do that with your kids. Because your mm. kids see, oh, dad, dad's angry today, guys. Like, oh, let's leave dad alone. But if you actually sit here and be like, you know what? Like, and explain to them, hey, by the way, it's not your fault. This is what I have going on. You're keeping them in a loop and helping them understand, you know, hey, this is, it, again, it's not your fault. This is what I'm going through. This is a life thing. And then when you come up with a, a situation like this, this is how you can handle it. Or this is how I'm going to handle it better. And so they don't think necessarily take things as personal because they think they understand the entirety of that situation. If that makes sense. I love the modeling here, right? This is the modeling of the, the situation, you know, just saying I, I, and I do this all the time with my daughter. I'm like, oh, you know what? 
I just snapped at you and um, I'm taking ownership for that. Like it wasn't appropriate and this is not how we should be acting. Um, here's, you know, like typically I'm like, well, here's the frustration that I felt. This is either fair or not fair, or these are the expectations, or we've discussed this in the past or just, you know what? I was distracted. I wasn't really thinking. And therefore, um, you know, I, you know, I, I did that and just saying, Hey, you know, I apologize. And, um, that's been something I, I love that kind of reconnecting and showing. And I think what it's, what I think it's doing for you, I think for you as the father is showing that you're fallible, showing that you're human, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to be perfect and that you don't have to get it right all the time. And I think it gives permission to your kids to have their bad things. You know, like I'm thinking about, you know, you know what I'm thinking? Uh, they're, they're bad moods and swings. Remember in the movie Inside Out, when mm-hmm. uh, they they move to the new house and then they have the 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 dinner conversation, mm-hmm. did did you do you remember that part? Yeah, and how the dad has the go to DefCon one sequence in his head playing on, like, and he puts the <laughs> foot down and they have the red button and they like they do the whole nuclear launch sequence and they do that. And yeah. It's like I I love that because that is the typical response. Like mm-hmm. the typical response for men is, oh, my kids acting out, they obviously don't respect me. Therefore, I'm going to put my foot down, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's like trigger response as opposed to like, well, oh, okay. Like you're, you're this roommate with me. You're, 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 you're my kid. I'm responsible for you, but you're a roommate for me is, uh, is an interesting, um, uh, paradigm. You're still responsible for them. They're not an actual roommate, but, um, you can be a good roommate to them and model that behavior. Uh, Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then to to add to that, one thing I try, I really try to focus on is if ever there's any disciplinary action or like consequences, like when they start, when something happens and you know what, hey, you're not going to be safe or something like that. Like I have to, whatever disciplinary action that you have, I always end it with, I love you because I want them to understand, hey, it's, it's, it's okay. You're human. I still love you, but I have to do this. Right. Right. And so when you con- when you contextualize the have to do that, is there any extra extra context there? Usually, yes, usually I explain why I have to do it. So the the, the why it. is the why is always you always have to say the why otherwise it wouldn't make any sense like, "Oh, do this cuz I told you to." Well, if I give you the why, you'll understand yeah. and maybe that won't happen again in the future. Do you, do you set up like, uh, in your house, just as a, out of curiosity, do you set up like values? Do you have like rules set up like in your house where your kids can like, where you talk about them? Like, Hey, these are the rules. These are the, 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 uh, the value set. These are the, the mantras for the family. No, but that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <Awesome>. Okay. <laughs> what are the, uh, it, it was, a, I remember a long time ago I had a guest and, and unfortunately I lost the interview, but what he ended up doing was he had a lot of young kids and he created little characters. So it was like, were you courageous tiger or were you disciplined, don- not, not donkey, disciplined rhino or something like that? Like just fun little animal things. And mm-hmm. when they were doing their debrief at the kitchen table, you know, if, if the, if one of the kids was telling a story, they're like, oh, that sounds like awesome though. You were courageous tiger during that moment. You really did that. And then, uh, you know, or you could ask those questions to contextualize it. And and it's all based in these, these, these rule sets where you say like, well, this is what the family means. Like what's the Fendora family mean? What does the twining family mean? You know, Mm -hmm. and just having that document and saying like, okay, this is what it means to be a twining. This is what it means to be a Fendora. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Matt, uh, this is so great. And I love the introduction and the discussion into mental health. I love the growth and the purpose side. If folks want to get a hold of you, you know, where can they reach out to you? Yeah. So, um, I'm very active on LinkedIn and Instagram. And then I also have my own, uh, website as well. And that's how I do my coaching is through my website. Awesome. You'll find the links in the description. Uh, Matt Fendor, everybody.